Oh, it's 2015. Frank Ocean just posted a picture on his Tumblr of him alongside two piles of magazines with the caption, I got two versions. I got two versions. Now, for any other artist, this would be nothing out of the ordinary, but for an artist like Frank Ocean, who manifests himself once in a fucking blue moon with things like this? What's up, guys? Uh, good evening and shit. That was a sign from God that something was coming soon. Soon. Like, next month, guys. Uh, never mind. Uh, uh, next year. And what we got was this. For approximately 19 days, a live stream was turned on and off on Frank's website in which he appeared to be building something in an empty warehouse. This turned out to be a spiral staircase, which was built alongside the artist Tom Sachs, who referred to it as the stairway to heaven. When the staircase was finally done, Frank began to climb it, and when he reached the top, nothing. The live stream was cut off. This live stream was later released on Apple Music as a short film slash visual album named Endless. But wait a minute. Frankie wasn't done. He's got two versions. The next day, August 20th, 2016, Frank Ocean released another full-length album, Blonde, this time on every streaming services and his own label. Through its 17 tracks, it gives us a very personal look at an entire period of his life when he was just a teenager. We follow a young Frank navigating through relationships, friends, drugs, and heartbreaks all while searching for something so unobtainable that is actually the closest to him. Nike's is the beginning of the story Frank Ocean tells on Blonde. And this story begins with a young Frank, a teenager. You'll notice straight away that Frank's voice is higher than normal here. It's a really odd way to start your album. It's like your voice is the most angelic thing in the world and you're gonna pitch it up and down? Well, this is to show even better the concept of being a teenager. Frank is surrounded by people who just care about Nikes, their appearance, and at that time, Frank is not excluded from that. All you want is Nikes, just like me. Frank then introduces his little cousin, who's a drug dealer. And we also get introduced to his girl, who works in a drug business with him. We can definitely imagine this as a sort of a party setting. These guys are hanging out, Frank probably invited them, probably along with other people. They're all getting high and they're out by the pool. And as you do at a party, Frank starts a conversation with that girl and she begins to talk about her relationship with Frank's little cousin at the moment. Now, we know that she's the cousin's girl, so you'd think she and the cousin are dating, right? But that's not really the case. I mean, it seems like there's a significant lack of interest coming from this guy. They have good but very little conversation, but she met his friends last week, and because of that, she thinks maybe this will turn into a relationship. So, to me, this is not his girlfriend. It just seems like a girl who really likes a boy that doesn't love her back or pay any attention to her. Frank seems to sympathize with her situation and just keeps on talking with her until. We'll let you guys prophesy. 
Notice how Frank's voice changes back to normal here. This is interesting because it showcases Frank changing characters from him being a teenager to him now. Him looking back on these moments. Blonde is not a classic story told in the tracks from the album from beginning to end. It's more like Frank's reflection and thoughts on a story he's lived. It's like we're just passengers in a car with Frank and we're looking back in the rearview mirror as he tells you a story and comments on it. We'll let you guys prophesy, we gonna see the future first. Like, he knows this story he's about to tell, so he sees the future, but we, the listener, don't know it yet, so we can just prophesize. Anyways, back at the party, Frank still seems to be chilling with that girl from earlier, and they're a bit further away from where the party is now. They're just watching other people dance at this point. We get really wonderful imagery of just two young teenagers who are probably high, laid out on their backs watching the stars away from a party. Frank says, I know that your nigga came with you. But he ain't with you. Then Frank clearly mentions interest for that person. That night, he just shoots his shot. I may be younger, but I look after you. I'm not him, but I mean something to you. He wants to mean something in the eyes of this girl, even though she's probably not even interested. She clearly likes another guy, if you look at the lyrics. But it seems like Frank still ends up hooking up with her. You got a room and you hear what we do. It's only awkward if you fuck it up too. I thought that I was dreaming when you said you love me. Whoa. I didn't expect that. That's just confirmation that it's mutual. They love each other now. Like, it's official. But no, 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 no. That's not the girl in Nikes. That's actually a completely different person. It might seem confusing, but that's what's so interesting about this album. It's not about only one person or relationship. It's about Frank's teenage years as a whole. So Ivy is not a continuation of the story on Nikes, but actually a tale of Frank's first ever love. So to avoid confusion, let's name these people, I guess. And by naming them, I mean ask ChatGPT to name them appropriately. So we got Nikea, the girl in Nikes, and Eviana, the girl in Ivy. Thank you, thank you, fucking AI. I thought that I was dreaming. Anyways, going back to Ivy, this song takes place most likely a few years before the story in Nikes. It's believed to be about Frank's first love because of the resemblance this song has to a letter he wrote to his first love in 2012 on his Tumblr. And even though Iviana was his first love, their relationship wasn't that great. If I could see the walls, I could see it faking. Back then, if he could see through walls, see behind the facade of his girlfriend, he would have been able to tell it's fake. Whatever she feels for him, it's not love. However, for Frank, it's the contrary. He's constantly thinking about that person and their relationship together. This is just an unhealthy relationship. The title, Ivy, refers obviously to poison ivy. It may look pretty, but when it's on you, it's really bad. So in that way, it could kind of illustrate an unhealthy relationship. And Ivy grows in spring. That's right, the text I've put at the beginning of this video. And that's where this album becomes interesting. I found a theory on Reddit from the user, this guy, who proposed that Blonde was divided in four chapters, four seasons, spring, summer, fall, winter. The story Frank tells follows a loose timeline of seasons and the themes associated with seasons. 
For example, spring is associated with growth, renewal, like obviously, and the relationship on Ivy was Frank's first love and makes Frank grow from it. And the concept of growth and renewal also makes sense with Nikes and Nikea, right? Because this relationship is blooming right now. It just started. And this continues in the next season, but I'm not gonna say too much right now. So let's just keep going. Yeah, yeah. Pink Plus White is the third song on Blonde and the last one in the spring period. The title refers to colors you'd imagine in a beautiful sunset. If the sky is pink and white, if the ground is black and yellow. It's also kind of cool there's a song on Channel Orange, Frank's previous album, titled Pink Matter, and another song on this album called White. So, Pink Plus White. That's funny. On this song, two main things happen. First of all, he elaborates on the relationship he's living right now with Nikea. But most importantly, he talks about the death of a close friend and the lessons that friend taught him, saying repeatedly, you showed me love. And these themes are kind of evident, especially in the second verse. If you could die and come back to life, up for air from the swimming pool. If you look even further in the lyrics, you can tell that it's probable that this friend died during Hurricane Katrina. When Hurricane Katrina struck New Orleans, entire neighborhoods vanished under 20 feet of water. The devastation ranks as one of America's worst natural disasters. Frank was actually a young student at the University of Orleans when that hurricane hits. So it would make sense in the context of this teenage year story, right? Going back to that line, you showed me love. It's pretty obvious that this could have a double meaning. One being the lesson a friend showed you and what's happening right now with Frank and Nikea. He's falling in love with someone. And either way you take it, as advice or love, it's a sign of growth from Frank. But then Frank says something pretty striking. It's all from here. Frank knows the future and apparently something's about to go wrong. But most importantly, Frank seems to be obsessed with this idea of immortality. Say what up to life, immortality. This could just be associated with being young, right? You're just a teenager, you think you're gonna live forever. But in the context of this song, it's kind of understandable Frank could be thinking about dying with the passing of his friend. There might be something more to that. There is something more to that. So keep it in mind. This is life, life, immortality. Many college students have gone to college and gotten hooked on drugs. Mar Be Yourself is the fourth track on Blonde and the first interlude. You'll notice a certain music is playing through the background of this song. And this music is, I think, one of the greatest things about this album. Like, this music makes me feel so much things, but an extreme feeling of nostalgia for some reason. Just put it in the background of any video on your phone. I swear to God, it's gonna make it a hundred times better. And you'll notice this song comes back a lot in this album. As you can see in the track list, this is all the places where it appears. And it acts as a separator between the different seasons or chapters of this album. As for the song, it's basically a voicemail from a woman who talks to his son about life lessons and that, of course, he needs to start being himself. At first, it was thought that this woman was actually Frank's mom because the song ends like this. This is mom, call me, bye. That's not the case. This woman is Rosie Watson, not Frank's mom. And on the plus side, she was also the woman heard on Not Just Money, the track from Channel Orange. Listen, stop trying to be somebody else. Have you noticed how Frank acts in the first three songs of this album in the spring period? He gets high, he fucks bitches, he drives cars, but maybe that's not such a good thing 
that materialistic mindset. Do not smoke marijuana. It's all fake, right? Like this relationship in Ivy with Iv Iviana, I'm still getting used to the names. Frank at this point in the album is in two relationships. One relationship where the other girl is not in love with them and the other where it just failed. These relationships don't work right now. So going back to that advice from Rosie, how could you expect for a love relationship to work if you can't even be yourself? Maybe that's what Frank needs right now. Hand me a towel, I'm dirty dancing by myself, gone off tabs, but I asked <laughs> Okay, so now we know at least what he thinks of that advice. It's been four seconds, he's already high. It's interesting that a song called Solo comes right after Be Yourself. It's kind of a way for Frank to express himself freely with very minimal production and just him soloing. That's why it's called Solo. This song is the continuation of Frank and Nikea's relationship. If you just look at the first verse, for example, they're high on drugs and they're partying until the police come and breaks down their party. Maybe even the same party that was described in Nike's. Frank takes the time outside to tell Nikea how much she means to him and how he wants a real relationship with her and we don't gotta be solo pretty cute i mean that <laughs> that strikes a chord okay i'm a man but then we get straight up this so mellow fuck around be cutting you think we were better off solo probably just a retrospective thought from frank as he tells this story saying that he himself will cheat on her eventually and that this relationship maybe wasn't a good thing he knows the story already i feel like it's the fifth time i'm saying this but it, you remember it but how is this relationship right now in the story blow me and i owe you two grams in a sunrise basically he gets blowjobs in exchange for drugs what a healthy relationship. We know that Frank is a bit obsessed with the idea of immortality or heaven. If we look at the previous songs like Pink Plus White or even The Stairway to Heaven from Endless, that theme is kind of what this chorus is about. In hell, in hell, there's heaven. Gathering all these clues together, we can get more context on what Frank means when he always brings back heaven and immortality. Now we know he's trying to find ways to reach heaven on earth. The stairway to heaven, that was him trying to reach heaven. And now on Solo, he's trying to reach heaven by inhaling weed and getting high. So now we know his ultimate goal on this album reaching heaven on earth. Anyway, the second verse is more personal and talks about what Frank was usually doing and feeling like at that time of his life. I'm skipping showers and switching socks, sleeping good and long. But the most interesting part of this verse is the end where Frank says he went somewhere and he's got weed, but it's just him alone and no Nikea, even though he's waiting on her, they get high together, that's their thing, that's their kind of love relationship in a way. But it's just me and no you stayed up till my phone died. I think that says a lot about their relationship. He's all alone, smoking at night, literally waiting for a call or a text from the girl he loves, but he waits so long his phone dies and he just goes to sleep like that, alone, solo. This is joy, this is summer. 
Skyline 2 acts as a sort of interlude between the song's solo and self-control. Therefore, it's still referring to Frank and Nikea's relationship. Making sweet love, taking time. Given that their relationship right now is defined as you give me drugs, I give you sex, it's no surprise that the first verse of this song is about one of these things. Pretty fucking underneath moonlight now. We get a few more references to the summer season, which is associated with freedom and infinite potential. And that's kind of how Frank feels right now. This relationship can only go up from here right now. But he still seems happy about it. Maybe he's not fully satisfied with it, but he's happy, I guess. Can you call when I call again? This is likely a response to the last line of Solo, where Frank is smoking alone, waiting for this girl to answer his calls and texts. This is just validating even more how much this person means to Frank and how he wants more out of this relationship. Right now, it's not love, it's just fucking and smoking. He wants to be more than that. However, it's not clear yet how Nikea feels about that. But still, Frank is so happy when he sees this girl. You can see it in the lyrics. When the night comes, he stops seeking for gold. Because he's got it when she's with him. In comes the morning. But then the morning comes and she needs to leave again. Right from the start of self control, we're again introduced to Frank's pitched up voice that he uses to portray himself as a teenager. And obviously, you're thinking right off the bat oh, it's gotta be about Nikea again, right? They're by the pool, it's still summer, and Frank still seems like he's so desperate to be in love with that girl. I'll be the boyfriend in your wet dreams tonight. He wants to be fantasized about by this person. But the more you go through the song, it gets weirder. Some nights you dance with tears in your eyes. Okay, I'm sorry. There's no way this is Nikea. He just spent the last two songs acting like a simp for her. And now she's crying. She's dancing with tears in her eyes. What the fuck? This song is kind of like Ivy. A tale separated from the main story where we learn about another relationship Frank had in his youth. It really seems like these two care about each other. However, they don't quite connect. Frank even said about this song that that was written about someone who I was actually in a relationship with, who wasn't an unrequited situation. It was mutual. It was just we couldn't really relate we weren't really on the same wavelength. Cause you see me like a UFO. This partner sees Frank like a UFO, someone that you don't really understand. And also it's a flying object, so it can mean he's always high, he always gets high. And Frank made this person use their self-control, meaning at some point, even though this person cared for Frank, they were like, back off, you know? And in reverse, Frank himself lost his self-control. Even though it's probably over, Frank still wants to have a place in his partner's mind. Something that we've already heard before in Nikes when he says, I'll mean something to you. That's something that's apparently very important to Frank. He wants it all to have meant something and to still have a place in their heart. The song ends with this beautiful outro where Frank is kind of begging his partner to stay the night one last time. Just a night, night, night. But we do learn that this person that is described on self control already has someone else.
is a good guy. He healed it up. Good Guy is another short interlude that tells the story of Frank going on a blind date with a guy in a gay bar in New York. It's a gay bar, you took me to. If you didn't know, uh, Frank is bisexual. And that's something that's pretty crucial in this album, especially in the title. You've probably noticed that the text on the cover doesn't match the name of the album on streaming services. On the cover, blonde is spelled like it's a blonde guy, and the album title is spelled like it's a blonde girl. And that's supposedly to illustrate, in a way, Frank's bisexuality. Anyway, in Good Guy, it's pretty clear that this guy is supposedly interested in Frank. Though, as the evening goes on, Frank realizes that this is not gonna turn into anything romantic, R referring to it as just night shit. Remember in Solo when Frank admitted that he was fucking around while being with Nikea? This song could be one of his hookups while he was still with Nikea. Then the song abruptly cuts to a seemingly random conversation with the blonde theme playing in the background the same music that was on Be Yourself. The conversation is in between two random guys, none of them being Frank, and they're just talking about bitches. But now I don't care about bitches like that, my nigga. That shit, Jasmine fucking wrecked my heart. The inclusion of this sample here makes sense if you take into account the songs from the summer chapter. In the summer, Frank seems to fuck around a lot. Of course, it's associated with freedom. Like, there was three different people he fucked around with, during that period, and one of them broke his heart on self-control, like Jasmine did for this dude. So with this, we can already tell what's the purpose of these little interludes, these recurrent interludes. They're random situations, not related to Frank, that are similar to what he's living right now. Relatable situations, which is kind of ironic because I feel like this album is in itself a relatable situation a lot of people can relate to, but in this album, they're relatable situations Frank can relate to right now. The first part of Knight's details of the continuation of Frank and Nikea's relationship. And since we've entered fall right now, there's a pretty drastic change to Frank's perception of things. Because in any song before Knight's, Frank is such a simp for this girl. Like, he never says anything negative about her, even though she acts like a total asshole with him. You don't even got nobody being honest with you. And he can't help himself to just tell her the truth for once. I ain't trying to keep you, can't keep up a conversation, can't nobody read you. If you remember, these are two things mentioned in previous songs. In the first track, Nikea says she doesn't talk much with Frank's little cousin, but they still have good conversation. Now, in Nights, Frank's like, no, you can't keep up a conversation, and you never answer me. I was waiting for you all night that one time to answer my calls, and my phone died before you ever did. Basically, Frank is starting to clearly communicate why he's unhappy right now. But he's also unsure. It's like we're oscillating between a Frank who's a total simp for the girl, and one who's sick of her. In the chorus, for example, he's like, no, He doesn't want to spend the night anymore, because she just leaves right after. She doesn't care about Frank. But two lines later, literally, he says, We're oscillating between two Franks so quickly, and they're completely opposing each other in terms of what they want. It's like day and night, right? My every day shit, every night shit, every day shit. And as the day ends, it's like he gets back to his old self again. It's like he forgets everything negative he's just said. 
Frank almost sounds like he's saying he's been waiting all his life for this girl, which is a huge thing to say. Like, there's nothing that he said previously that tops any of that. It's like it's the highest point of their relationship, and nothing he's gonna say will be as high as this ever again. This beat switch you just heard in Nights marks a turning point in the album. Literally. The album switches to night mode. It comes right at the 30 minute mark of the record, and that's the exact halfway point the middle of the album, which separates Blonde into two different parts. The day part being composed more of love songs, and the night part being more laid back and darker than the first half. It's all downhill from here. Every night fucks every day up. Every day patches the night up. The second part of Nights gives us a bit more lore on this relationship between him and her. If you remember, while Frank was in college, he was affected by Hurricane Katrina, and apparently Nikea was the one who housed Frank while he relocated. After Trina hit, I had to transfer campus. Your apartment not in use is why I waited. This verse only contains memories from when he was young. No commentary, no thoughts on it, and guess what? Frank's voice is pitched up. Then we get the same chorus that was in the first part, repeated once again, highlighting Frank's uncertainty about what he wants. We get also another reference to the concept of heaven. Nirvana is a perfect place of happiness, often associated with heaven. And that confirms what we thought on Solo, right? Frank is actively looking for his Nirvana. He wants to find his heaven on Earth. Solo reprise is the only song on Blonde where Frank isn't singing. Instead, Andre 3000 from Outkast delivers a verse about two main themes that you probably already know at this point. Being solo, alone, and being so low mentally. Um, solo that I can see under the skirt of an ant. Solo that I don't get high no more when Even I though you can take this verse as what Andre 3000 is feeling like at that point of his life. This also gives us indirect insight on what's happening right now in the story. In this album, we never get information on how Nikea reacts to Frank telling her, I don't like how this relationship is going right now. But given he is so low mentally, he can see under the skirt of an ant and that he doesn't get high no more, which was the thing he did the most with this girl. We can theorize that she didn't take it well, but is she gone for good? Is she just really fucking mad? Uh, we don't know. We also get a bar mentioning Summer's End. Looking at the other kids with astonishment while I'm on punishment watching the summer come close to an end. Further cementing the Four Seasons theory, but also saying that this period of freedom and fun has just ended. <laughs> Pretty Sweet is song 11 on Blonde, and each time this song starts, I'm like, what the fuck is happening? The song has a very chaotic structure, and therefore it's hard to clearly pinpoint what Frank means in the lyrics. But it's all themes we've heard before though. But maybe we get also some answers on how Frank's relationship is going right now. Wow, okay. You wanna keep me Calm the fuck down, woman. Who's this girl? Tron Cat? He just said you were boring in conversations. You don't have to kill anybody. We can just tell that whatever's happening, it's not a healthy relationship. However, Frank does say this. On the other side, on this side. 
This is referring to the two different sides of the record, the day mode and night mode we're currently in. And now he's literally saying, fuck the other side. I'm on this side now. All the cute corny shit like, ooh, let's just hang out by the pool with my friends. Fuck this. No, I'm on this side now. I'm sad. Given the lyrics and the last song, it feels like something bad happened. And we don't even know what it is. It's crazy. It's like we live the beginning of the relationship in great detail. But now we get to the heartbreak part and the conflict. And it's like it's just censored or blurred out. Look, Frank even resorts to prayer in the end of this song. What the fuck happened to make you get down on your knees and pray to God that everything's gonna be all right? And then it completely switches. Sounds like Frank being more honest about his feelings is tearing the relationship apart, but also tearing Frank apart between is she bad for me? Or is she what I need? I was just telling that I got this, this girl before. Facebook story is the third interlude in the album and marks the end of the fall season. If we take all the other interludes we had, Be Yourself and Good Guy, these were all summaries or very closely related to the events of the previous songs before. So if we take this interlude as related to the events of Nights, Solo Reprise and Pretty Sweet, it's not looking good. That I, I got this, this girl before. The man speaking is French producer Sebastian, who's telling a story about a girl he dated for about three years, and especially the time she asked him to accept her on Facebook. I don't want it because I was like in front of her, in front of her. And the girl took it worse than expected. She thought her boyfriend was cheating and just didn't want to accept her in fear of finding another girl in his Facebook friends. She told me like, uh, it, uh, it's over, yeah, I can't believe you. Now, this could mean a lot of things. First of all, this could be somehow a reenaction of what happened between Nights and this song. Not in the way that Frank didn't accept her invitation on Facebook literally, but how Frank expressed some concerns about the relationship, like in Nights, for example, and how she didn't take it well. But there's one thing for sure. By now, Frank and Nikea have broken up. Close to You is song 13 on the album, and the first one in the winter season. This song is actually a cover of a Stevie Wonder song with the same name. But anyway, right from the bat, we can tell that this is all happening after the breakup. I'll be honest, I wasn't devastated. But I don't think it's about his breakup with Nikea because he's not devastated by it. Close to You is most likely about the heartbreak on self-control where they agreed they just didn't connect. Why am I preaching? Either way, I think it's a pretty cute way of ending the arc of this relationship because even though this relationship is over, he still feels somehow close to her with the memories he's keeping. In that way, Frank still means something to them. Bad luck to talk. On these Bring out the tissues, this one's gonna be hard, guys. <laughs> the last three tracks of the winter period are all about Nikea, 
starting with White Ferrari. And these three tracks are all following the five stages of grief in a relationship. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Starting with denial in White Ferrari. So what's the denial phase in a breakup? Basically, it's the very first phase after a breakup where you think that the other person is gonna come back to you eventually. You're just in shock, which makes you go like, this didn't happen, right? She's gonna come back in a few minutes and we're gonna be good, right? And that's what's so heartbreaking about this song. In the first two verses of the song, it's like nothing happened. He's in complete denial. White Ferrari had a good time. Frank is just recalling a car ride with his lover, like nothing bad happened. It's like you don't want it to be over yet, even though you're just lying to yourself, thinking about good times, good times, and only good times. In the second verse, Frank starts to remember more negative parts about his partner, especially about her being too basic or not having any style or originality of her own. That could also be associated with the second phase of a breakup, anger, little bursts of like, well, you were fucking basic. And that's kind of coming back to Frank slowly, but then he just forgets all about it and gets back to being in denial about the breakup. I care for you still and I will forever. Which finally brings us to the final verse in this song, which in my opinion is the most heartbreaking. I'm sure we're taller in another dimension. That always hits. Like, <laughs> just imagining that in another world you're still together if maybe you did things differently. Here, it's just Frank holding on to the last tiny bit of hope he has left to make things work. Even though his partner doesn't even hold this relationship to a point where it's worth anything. You say we're small and not worth the mention. To her, this is just a fling, or friends with benefits, clearly. We go into the bargaining stage here. It's basically the stage where a partner is begging the other one to come back. We could vacay places to go. But she doesn't care, obviously. She's already made up her mind, especially when Frank says, this is such a beautiful line. She's holding this relationship in prison because that's all she wanted, to fuck and get high. And Frank feels like he's a prisoner in that, in those invisible walls she imagines. Frank can never leave this box of just being fuck friends. White Ferrari is about denial and bargaining. Siegfried is about the depression stage, where Frank is just at rock bottom. The title Siegfried is most likely referring to Siegfried, a warrior from Norse mythology. Basically, in the legends, Siegfried slays a dragon named Fafnir and falls in love with the princess Brunild. It wouldn't be an overstatement to say, well, this character in this legend is brave, right? Which contrasts completely the actual song. I'm not brave! With Frank reminiscing over wrong things he has done with Nikea. I couldn't gauge your fears. While repeatedly screaming that he's not brave, that he's a fool. He even starts putting his character into question. Maybe I should move, settle down, two kids in the swimming pool. Leave all this reckless teenager lifestyle and just grow up, get a house and have kids. 
maybe that's gonna make the pain less worse. This is one of the most interesting songs on Blonde because the more you go into it, the more it gets abstract. I've tried hell the other side of the Every night fucks every day up. Every day patches the night up. It's all an endless cycle to Frank. This relationship, these seasons, this life. We can take this like with the two sides of the album, day and night. The day is the beginning of something new. We fall in love, we're free, we're happy. And the night is where everything falls apart. Every night fucks every day up. This album is a loop in a way, but it's not just about this album. We're all in an endless loop of falling in and out of love until we either reach heaven or hell. It's just life. But for Frank, he can't accept it yet. To him, it's like saying goodbye not to just a person, but to a whole version of himself. This is not my life. Just a to he dissociates himself from who he was with Nikea. This guy is just an old friend now. It feels like Frank is not thinking straight right now, like he's really high or something. Because the more he says things, the more it becomes complicated, let's say. Speaking of Nirvana, it was there. We've heard Frank mention Nirvana before, and more specifically, his search for it. God, this stairway to heaven, this lust for immortality, ultimate fulfillment. He's been searching for this since the beginning of this album. He's been obsessed by it. He realizes it was just there. And now it's gone. And maybe that's what led to the demise of this relationship. Frank's search of perfection, paradise. You can't find heaven on earth. There's no heaven on earth. There's nothing out there that will make you so happy that you can't even imagine a world where you're just a teeny more happy than that, right? It can always be a little better if we imagine it in our heads. So if you're someone who's actively looking for that, like Frank here, uh, you'll miss it. You'll just miss something great. And although this relationship was far from perfect, maybe he didn't realize how important it was for him. Think of the dream of the thought that could think of dreaming and getting the glimmer of God. There's a super good imagery Frank does here where he tries to imagine what a glimmer of God could look like. But in the end, he can't. Thought that could think of dreaming a dream where I cannot. We can take this glimmer of God as this final glimmer of hope. He can be with Nikea, right? He can't even dream about the thought of being with her. That's how far he's down. Frank manages to calm himself down though and be more rational. Less more roast and more present. Dwell on my gifts for a second. He gets back to inhaling some smoke, eating shrooms, crying about her, but in the end, he can only think about one thing. I do for you in the dark. He's so in love with her that he'd do anything for her, even if she herself didn't know about it, just to make her happy. Godspeed is the penultimate track on Blonde, and one of the simplest ones, in my opinion. It's just about the acceptance step in the breakup, and bidding farewell to your lover. Of course, with the name Godspeed, we get religious references in the song, almost like a prayer for Nikea. Wishing you Godspeed, glory. 
Wishing someone Godspeed is really just wishing someone safety and luck on their journey. And it's a good way to end this adventure. He lets go of his claim on her. They just go different ways. And that's it. One thing that I'd like to mention before moving on is um, the Boys Don't Cry magazine, which has a screenplay titled Godspeed in it. So obviously there's some correlation with this track. So I'd like to quickly overview it and summarize it um, just to see what it's about. The screenplay tells the story of Steely, who's described as a charismatic and well-liked guy, but emotionally guarded, basically a character that really resembles Frank. Steely has a few friends and a girlfriend named Shuby. They are both college students, they're just chilling and having fun, having late car rides together, you know, the usual. One day, he just wakes up with Shuby, has a bowl of cereal, jacks off for some reason, and goes to class with her. Shuby says, I'm going to class. Steely says, we should go together. When he enters the stairs to head to class, he checks his phone and he's got a couple messages, a few from his friends and Shuby, nothing out of the ordinary, except one from an unknown contact. Have a day you dreamed of. That's kind of creepy, uh, coming from an unknown number, but Hey, whatever, he just doesn't respond and goes on with his day. It's crucial to know that this story is taking place in a sort of futuristic world, not that far off from right now, but still. And Steely loves stealing cars, but this time he wants to steal the car of a prolific inventor and CEO called Garter. So later that day, Steely and his friend go down to the office campus and try to park their car there because they know this inventor's mysterious car is parked at the same spot. When they come at the gate, a security guard tells them, hey, you, you can't park here, you need credentials, of course. To which Steely says, no, 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 I want to get this car. And he just gets out of the car and starts running into the parking structure. So, of course, the guard starts chasing after him, shouting for his credentials. So, Steely has got to hide or get out of there. Steely stumbles upon the inventor's car he wants to steal. He uses his breaking in cars skills, hops in it, and that's where he gets another text from this unknown caller, saying, Chase the rabbit three ways down. A ways to go. Steely is kind of taken aback. He's like, who's there? To which he gets the response, do you really have time? No, he doesn't. There's a security guard coming his way, so he starts the car, and guess what? There's an empty parking spot three floors down in the parking. So it seems that this unknown contact, unknown number, is kind of just looking over him. Later, he's driving with Shuby in this mysterious inventor's car, and Shuby plugs in a device she found in the car with rainbow wires, which, once it's plugged in, makes Steely trip so hard for a moment. One second he's driving, and the other he's describing his view like being on a floating island. He is so high, which makes him drop coffee on him. He takes a while to feel it, but eventually Steely stops the car and slowly comes back to reality. His girlfriend, Shuby, smiles at him. They're happy. And that's where he gets another message on his phone from that unknown number, which goes on and on and on. And that's the story. Um, look, it, it, it was a long story, so I broke it down a lot. But still, it's an interesting story, nonetheless. The real mystery here for me was this message at the end. I didn't really care about the story that much, but this message like, was like, what the fuck is this? What does that mean? And no one really had any theories. I even asked Chad GPT to help me in the final act of desperation. And what he came up for the meaning of this message is A, B, A, B, A, B. So that gets me nowhere, of course. Before you ask, it's not Morse code. It's not any 
language or like it, it's really just random stuff the only thing that is clear is that it's recurrent it's the same message over and over again if you would ask my take on what this message means and what this story means in the relation to the album, you can't find any sense to this unknown caller or this message because there isn't any. That's the point. It doesn't make sense to Steely at the time. To me, it's like in that moment, in the car, he gets a glimmer of God. It, it sounds silly, but this could be his nirvana. This could be the happiest moment he's ever lived and the happiest moment he's ever gonna live. He's just driving around with his girlfriend and being young and in love and free. But right now, at the point of his life, he doesn't understand it. It's like someone is trying to tell him, this is the best moment of your life. This is what the text could be. But to him, it's just gibberish. It goes on and on, but he doesn't care. He's already in his nirvana. He's already there. Future of Free is the final song on Blonde and serves as a sort of epilogue to the whole album. The song talks about what Frank took away from these teenage years and his accomplishments in the music industry. It's kind of a retrospective track about his life up until now. The title, Future of Free, is related to the font of the same name, but also to the themes of the song, looking forward to the future and appreciating what he's got now as an artist. This first verse all comes off as a discussion that Frank is having with his mom about how far he has come, which is an important topic in this song, so uh, keep that in mind. He's like, I'm making money, mama. These songs are like therapy, mama. Seeking like approval from his mother. And this fame and success is hard to bear for Frank because he doesn't want to lose it. Check of me, please give me immortality. It's like, I'm gonna die one day, so I'm fading rapidly, and I just want to live this forever, so make me, make me live forever. We get a cute line where Frank remembers how Tyler and him were good friends, even back before Odd Future blew up. But the most crucial line of this song is definitely the last one. All of this, his fame, his love relationships, were not something that Frank predicted or controlled, really. And even with all this heartbreak he's lived, if he had the chance, he just want to do it all again. The exact same way. Even though it went 180 on him, he would be begging to just live it all over again. Because nonetheless, those were the best years of his life. Make sure you speak up. Okay. What's your name? Ryan. Yo, hey, be quiet. You'd expect the album to end there, but after a minute of silence, we get these sort of old interviews. This is actually a compilation of recorded dialogue that's featured in the Boys Don't Cry magazine. It's in a page called Hopes and Dreams, where some relatives from Frank answer a bunch of questions like what's their names, what's their first memories, uh, and the superpower they'd choose if they had one. It's just like a final moment of strong nostalgia on Blonde with not only the Blonde theme, but also these children being interviewed. But the last question the interview or asks is pretty interesting. How far is a light year? How far is a light year? It seems pretty much out of place. Like you're asking kids who are probably 10 years old, how far is a light year? What, they're gonna answer like quantum mechanics questions to? And obviously uh, there's no answer. It's, it's just gibberish. That question is there to connect with what he said in the previous song. Well, future or free how far he's come 
proving it to his mama. That's kind of what I love about this ending. It's not ending the album clearly, it's just asking an open question. How far is a light year? How far we've come and how far can we still go? Blonde is not a classic over-the-top heartbreak uh, love story. And I think that's what makes it so interesting to learn about. Like, a normal real-life heartbreak is not a Hollywood performance or soundtrack where you're just begging for your Prince Charming to come back on your knees in the rain in the middle of the night. That's just not how things are in life. Breakups are fucking boring and lame. An album like Blonde has a story with imperfections, holes and blind spots inside it. We don't we don't even see why they break up. That's pretty major, right? But I mean, that's how you would tell your teenage years. I think it's so relatable because that's just how we tell ourselves our memories and story in our head. It's it's just like things that pop out like, oh yes, I did this. Oh yes, that I kind of regret that. If I could leave you with what I think is the best advice you can take from this album, um, just if you think back at a time in your life, whatever, good or bad, cherish the good that came from that and just drive away from it. Because that's all we can do, it's life. We move forward until we don't. Don't regret it, just move forward. It was all good and in the end, it's still gonna be all good.